right? No, the building was on the other side. Yeah. And uh, uh, the Hasid, by the way, the Labavitch got into it. It was a huge fight. They took it to the Geisha courts. It was a, it was a Shandana and a Kharpa. It was such a It was such a mess. And it was such a scandal that when he died, and he wasn't old when he died, um, they made a, a, a resolution villain and no more chief rabbi. Perhaps some of you have heard of this. The effect of Chaim Meiser and all that. Uh, this is why, because it was a terrible uh, mess. The situation was dysfunctional in, in a big way. I'll tell you again, you know, the Vilna Gaon was thrown into jail. It's, 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 it, 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 and, and the side, he, they lied to him. It's a whole huge mess. So this guy was his grandson, <laughs> great-grandson. And uh, the reason I have Mr. Epstein over here is there's this, this a wonderful uh, story. Ta you, you see the, the difference between of times and places. Uh, the charge against him was Shmuel ben Avigdor. They passed by his house 2 o'clock in the morning, and the lights were off. I mean, what are we paying you to do? What was a rub once upon a time? It's not a pastor. You don't pay any visits. You don't speak at funerals. You don't go to bar mitzvahs. You don't visit the sick. You don't even have to go to shul. So what are you supposed to do all day long? <laughs> we better see value for money. You should be learning 24-7. You get it? And uh, that's once upon a time. The reason I mentioned Israel Epstein, who was the head of the Jews College, is a famous story in England when he had his first stellar uh, somewhere in the north of England. I forget where. Uh, it was Millsboro, yeah. Yeah, we have Millsboro, yeah. The, he knows it's from there. And uh, it's a famous story that the congregation who got him, he was a great scholar, the congregation who got him, they said, you have a big electricity bill. This is 1920. What's electricity? So he says, I was staying up late at night and learning. So he says, we thought when we secured your services, we were getting a fully qualified clergyman. <laughs> <laughs> You see? So it's always a juxtapose. Anyhow, so there's Balabatim and Vilna in the 1750 and Balabatim. Okay. Now, um, anyhow, uh, his grandfather, by the way, uh, started the Velazhin Yeshiva. By that, I mean he gave the money to found the Velazhin Yeshiva. So he was buddies with Chaim Velazhiner. This is an inner circle. You get it? Um, his parents, grandparents, were members of what you call the wealthy merchant uh, class of Russian Jewry. They, they had them. There was an elite. These are the guys who had government contracts. They supplied the army, and then with the with the railroads. And so there were people. You think you think you're thinking a fiddler on the roof? No, I'm talking about the person who's a millionaire. He looks like somebody a fiddler on the roof. You see? Um, and this was, as I say before, a very uh, a classy sort of situation. Uh, his father died when he was young, but he was 13 years old. He went to Volozhin. 13 years old, he was one of the Eloys over there, and he gets in right because he's related to everybody, because his grandfather paid for the place and all this sort of thing. So right off the bat, he is buddy with the whole gang. In fact, Chaim Volozhin and him, Chaim Salvation and him were, uh, were uh, Chavrusas, and uh, he got him to, later on, uh, this guy, it's a guy's a lady, gets Chaim Brisket a job to teach in, in Volozhin. <laughs> right? So I mean, you don't get more inner circle of this than, than that sort of thing. Um, and in Volozhin, by the way, uh, this is not an issue. Like, you learn the whole shots. You know, it's a very large uh, way of looking at things. But after a year or two, he returns to Vilna, and he studies on his own and gets married at the young age, as people did at that time. Um, he's an original guy. He's not a product of any system. He was a real Eloy. That is, is very brilliant. Just to give you what I'm talking, he had a habit every Friday, uh, every Friday, uh, it was six hours straight learning, uh, either Mishnah Melch or the Nota Behuda. This is an interesting story. These are difficult swarm that I just mentioned. Okay? At the age of 20, already well married, they make him a, a member of the board of directors of Lajan Yeshiva, uh, which he remains uh, for the rest of his life. He is, as I say before, from the inner circle. He's the uh, bosom buddies with people like Chaim Salavechik. He goes into the tea business, all right? Which is something a lot of Jews went into if you were a certain class, part of the network of Vesatsky. Right? You only know Vysotsky from Israel, okay? Vysotsky comes, uh, this guy never went to college, never went to school, he went to Yeshiva, well, Yeshiva for a little bit. He's one of these guys that spent a few years in Yeshiva, then says, the business world is the world for me. And he, by the time he finished, he controlled one third of the tea in Russia. You know, see, yeah, so that was his market share, a third of the tea in Russia. He was a czar of the tea. And he had an international, uh, uh, you know, networks and things like this. I remember he uh, conquered, he, he, he controlled all the tea from Ceylon and things like that. And I'm talking about the 19th century when we're talking ruthless business competition. He's like, he would be in very well at the same bed with Omer Rockefeller. 
You understand? You 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 undercut the competition. You slice their throats. This and that and the other. I mean, that that that's how it was done in those days, uh, because it was the 19th century and it was a uh, pure capitalism. And uh, so he had networks of of agents all over the place around the world. So this guy got. I think he got part of that whole business. Although to be perfectly honest, I think his wife is the one who ran the uh, business, but he participated. And uh, <laughs> it's not unheard of. <laughs> okay. Um, anyhow. The point is that this is a guy who's not a loser, as I said before. Maybe a weirdo who's not a loser. And um, he was a mocker in the inner uh, politics of Russian Jewry. Uh, as you, if you know anything at all, there was a big fight about esrugs, esrogim. And they should use the Corfu esrug. And uh, that one was more kosher, it seemed to be, than uh, the esrugs that are being uh, imported from Israel. But on the other hand, the Chovet Sian, they say you should support the Israeli Esther to get a Jewish economy off the boat, and then the Greeks who lived in Corfu made a pogrom, you understand, and then they got together to jack up the price, and a group of activists led by this guy, they go to Rizal Khan Inspector, who's the main rabbi in Russia, so he goes, everybody listen to you, put a ban on the non-Israeli Esterics, right? Put a ban on the Corfu Esterics. And a lot of the other rabbis who were on the take, they said, no, the Corfu Esterics get better, and it was a big contest of wills, but the public followed Rizal Khan and they busted the, uh, the Greeks, you understand? Who, who re reacted by making another pogrom. So I'm just trying to show you this is the politics of once upon a time. So uh, by the time you get to the 1870s, 1880s, uh, Rabbi Sol Salanter, uh, Chaim Meiser Krasinski, Yitzhak Isaac Alevi Rabinowitz, which I'm talking about over here, um, other people like that, uh, Yaakov Levi Lipschitz, who's the, um, the, the secretary of the Yitzhak Inspector. These are names that were very famous in, in once upon a time. This is the circle of Russian Orthodox Judaism. When I use the word Orthodox Judaism, that's a very important term that I'm going to be using tonight. Orthodox doesn't mean traditional. Traditional means you just keep up the same ways without considering your position in the modern world vis-a-vis -vis other groups. Orthodox is self-conscious. Orthodoxy involves a, a sense of political self-consciousness. Orthodox means I only support other Orthodox. I'm opposed to the non-Orthodox. I have my own vision, my own way of doing so. I don't let somebody else tell me what my present and past is. I have my own. And, uh, and I see what others are doing. You get know what I'm saying? It's all, it's all conscious raising and self-perception. I see that these schools, even though they say they're traditional, are really good, not representing my interests. Uh, very few from Jews felt that way. Um, they were afraid to talk about it, including the Klein Spectre and people like that, because they don't want to provoke what should I say, the rich and powerful people of the traditionalist community who weren't so religious. But little by little, this is forming, and Israel Salanta, Yitzhak Levi Lipschitz are, are, are basic constituent members of the formation of this identity, which today is called Haredi. Okay? Um, it goes back literally to that time. Uh, Halevi, as I say before, uh, he, he and uh, the young kind of, this is the Secretary of Israel Inspector who writes a very famous uh, history book of his own, of his own times, in terms of this hard, very uh, uh, strongly delineated orthodoxy and anti haskalah Chaim Rezegrzynski, of course, you know about it, he became famous as a big rabbi later on. These are people who, in their young years are part of this movement in which you see the masses don't get it right. How can somebody be a from Jew and vote for a non from party? And then, uh, you know, how can you give your money to the JNF when they're using it for this and this and this? And all these sorts of ideas. Are not uh, are not new. Halevi, uh, our our hero here, the, the guy we're speaking. I tell you, Yitzhak Halevi. He's very connected with the with the fights for shechita. There was a famous guy, Dr. Dembo, who was a, a professor of uh, animal biology, and he gets it. It was a famous person in his day, and it wasn't religious. And he got to him and got him to write the books and deliver the uh, addresses at the scientific societies in Europe to defend shechita that it's not uh, bad. So here's a guy from uh, 1867, 1895 or so, about 30 years, who lives a very self-satisfied, perfect life of his own. Um, he's well-to-do, he's successful in business, he learns, um, he dabbles in all kind of uh, affairs, he's a macher in the, uh, he's really like the mover behind the shaker in the Kabbalah Yeshiva. You know, in other words, life is good for him, so to speak. But he is aware of the disintegration of traditionalism occurring among the mass Jews of the Russian Empire and of the constant hemorrhaging from the ranks of the from including from the ranks of the Bnei Yeshiva. Okay, let's get this straight. This is the era in which uh, Bialik, Berdachevsky, and others were in the Yeshiva and left. You follow? They, they, they moved past that, and they, the Yeshiva represents a retrograde, a fundamentalist, and backwards and incorrect understanding of Judaism. Now, uh, and, and, and the Yeshivas don't know how to do anything about this. 
Now, some of this is due to star materialism, okay? Desire to get a job. After all, the Shiva Becker, you're not going to do too well. But if you uh, become non religious, especially if you do like Kowalski over here, he, becomes a, <laughs> he said, well, they asked him, why'd you convert? You understand? He became a big professor. I spoke about it last summer. And he said, the best it's designed a professor in Petersburg via Malabar and Aishishok. You know, I, I, I get that. But the, that's, that's one reason. But some of this is due to historicism to the new narratives. Notice many of the yeshiva guys, like today they sneak on the blogs or something like that, at that time you would secretly read Gretz and Weiss and Frankel and Rappaport and this and that and the other, and the mashkir job in the yeshiva is to go raid the books. So it becomes like, like a Spanish Inquisition. Oh, yeah, yeah. You see? Um, when you read these books, the Chazal, the Tanayim Amroim, appear in a very different light than that taught in the yeshivas. And so you start to say, who's right? This obsesses Yitzhak Isaac Halevi Rabinowitz. He was going crazy over this. He reads all the books because he's an inveterate reader and he was pa passionate. I told you he's a weirdo. He's passionately interested in history. And his blood boils. He is particularly angry at what he perceives as the stupid mistakes, the deliberate falsifications, and the clear anti from ideological bias under the mask of scientific objectivity. Okay? In other words, what they're saying is wrong, and they're fooling everybody, taking advantage of the ignorance of the public to foist their agenda over here, and all these dumb yeshiva guys, others who naturally don't know what I know, are falling for it like flies. But for 30 years, he has a life, as I said before, and so all he does, he writes an occasional article about this in the From newspaper, that time, Halle out of Paris. But then in the mid-1890s, his business collapses. It's the 19th century. There's no insurance. There's no safety net. Okay, when you go bust, you go bust. He's bankrupt. Oilites of Busha, a guy who was a respected businessman, all of a sudden has to flee. He leaves Russia never to return. He might get arrested. Whoa, not so good. And so he would like to start business up again. And he wants to pay off his creditors. And for the rest of his life, I'm into, I'll give him credit, for the rest of his life, he's trying to save money. He paid off what he could from, 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 from the creditors. But he's in his 50s. As a no-go, too late to start again. You understand? And anyway, he says, perhaps it's a sign from heaven to abandon business and devote themselves to his true passion, which is Jewish history. Just look in the mirror and admit who you are. You see? He's been thinking about this subject for decades. His ideas have ripened and matured, and he dreams of being the Haredi Gretz <laughs> or the Haredi Weiss. He dreams of publishing his own grand narrative, a multi-volume Jewish history. His dream is that his book will be bestsellers and the sale of profits will enable him to pay off his creditors. He wanders through the European capitals in 1895, 6, 7, those eight, uh, in Pressburg and Berlin, here and there and the other, London, Paris, writing feverishly as he moves from town to town. In Frankfurt, he is befriended by Rabbi Horowitz. Uh-oh. <laughs> Do you know the German uh, politics of the 19th century? Uh, Frankfurt, there's from and then there's from. There's the Orthodox and then there's the Orthodox. And the Orthodox hold the Orthodox are not Orthodox. Okay? Basically, you will perhaps recall that St. Raphael Hirsch said you have to have outstreet. You have to leave the uh, Grossgemeinde. You have to leave the general community and start a separate Orthodox community with its own synagogue, its own JCC, its own everything. Oh, Vatikashis, cemetery, everything. But there were many Orthodox Jews that didn't agree with Hirsch, uh, believe it or not. And there were many Orthodox Jews that like this. I still want to be a member of the community. I don't have to become reform, but you, you know, can do. And the community itself, because they were scared of Hirsch, they said, we'll make you concessions. If you want to have an Orthodox shul and all that, you can have your own vodakashas. We'll pay for the mikvah. And so in Frankfurt, there's two of everything. It's two mikvahs. It's two Orthodox shuls. It's two Orthodox schools. It's two JCCs. I don't, you know, what else is left? You know, the two, two sports teams, two, two everything. Okay? And my goodness, if you go to the wrong school, or your cousin goes to the wrong thing, you know, I mean, let, let, me, let me make this very clear. If somebody from Hirsch's community had a cousin having a wedding in the, in the Orthodox shul of the Gross Gemeinde, you don't go to the wedding. You see? They'll, they'll stay outside, and when the chassan kala comes out, they'll wish the mazel tov. True or not? They, 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 you, you don't go in. I'll say this again. There's an Orthodox to Orthodox, okay? So uh, what happened was, that Hirsch said after 1876 that everybody has to leave the general community to secede. Uh, not many did, and he was real angry at those who did not. Those who didn't formed their own Orthodox community within the, like we would say today, under the associated, you see, who gave them all the money, and they took Marcus Horowitz, Mordechai Horowitz, to be 
the rabbi of the Orthodox community, which drove Hirsch crazy. He says, this guy's a total sinner uh, because he's participating in the, you know, uh, in the Reformed community and all the rest of it. He's saying it's an Orthodox. And, uh, and he was a student of Hildesheimer, by the way. So Hirsch said to Hildesheimer, said, how can you let your student do this? And Hildesheimer was very close with him. Doesn't get better than this. And so Hildesheimer writes him a letter. He says, I think you should, you should not take the job. But he says, I'm taking this job. Okay. So how can you say okay? <laughs> you know? And so it was very bitter. Okay? Extremely bitter. And now Halevi, who's just a from guy running away from Russia, trying to write a history book, walks into Frankfurt in the 1890s. It's the wrong time to be. And if you, you, know, if you go to Shomrede, you can't go to Aguda. You, you can't go to here. You know, it's, it's like that. But um, right, Mordechai Horowitz, who uh, was, as I say before, a student. Breuer and Horowitz have the opposite shoals, Okay? No, he's one shul, he's the other shul, and he declares this shul treif, and that's how life is lived. So, um, anyhow, uh, Horowitz likes him, he said like this, I'll give you a letter of introduction to the chief rabbi of, Paris, of, of France, Sardar Khan, and he has connections with the Alliance Israelite Universelle. Um, you can see how uh, assimilated or acculturated the French were. He looks like a, a priest. Because in other words, you, wait a second, he was a Shomer Shabbos, but you won't get no respect. This is Rodney Dangerfield. You're not going to get any respect if you look like a, an Orthodox rabbi. You know, you, the, the Jews of France want him to dress like this. Get it? So uh, this is Tzadok Khan. And uh, as they say before, he's the chief rabbi of France. Uh, the last chief rabbi of France, actually, the, in, in the formal sense. And um, he has connection with Rothschild and the Alliance uh, Israeli Universal, which was uh, the Kol Yisrael Chaverim. This was the big organization of the French uh, millionaires. And, he, and, and basically, Horowitz, the old boy network, he says, you know, this guy's got interesting history ideas, uh, pay for his book. You understand? Uh, financed a book. Uh, Khan uh, does so. And believe it or not, this ultra-Orthodox book is published by the Reform, Reform Jews of France. They don't know what they're dealing with over here. Um, when they realize this is Haredi stuff, they're shocked. And that's the, then they withdraw all the money after the first volume. Eventually, Horowitz finds him. He says, I, he, said, we, he says, a guy like you is gifted. You're a little weird, but he's gifted. All great people are weird. He says, you're a little you're gifted. We've got to find you the nice teller. And so he looks all over Germany. Horowitz, who was the rabbi in Frankfurt. And he found him a very nice little situation of a shtibel, a close, in, in Hamburg, in which a rich guy had died 100 years before and left a stiftung, as they call it, which means a Karen Kayamis, you know, a, uh, what's the right word? What's the word? Endowment. endowment. That's a good word, yeah. An endowment. And uh, basically, it's a small show with a decent salary. And, and your only job in the week is not even to attend services, just to give a class two hours on, on Shabbos. So that's a, that's a tailor-made. You get it? And that's what he, and that's what he did. Um, that's what he did for the rest of his life. The last 10, 12 years of his life before he died. So that's when he had time to write. He had a little stellar in Germany. This and that and the other. It's not in, in fact, he didn't even dive in there every day, to tell you the truth. But it wasn't necessary. You get it? The local people ran their own minion. And, uh, you know, like I say, once a week he gives a, or twice a week he gave a Gemara class, which is well attended. And so, so in, in a certain sense, it's a sinecure. You know, it's a, it, it's a perfect situation for him. Uh, before that, he had spent two years in Bad Hamburg. If you know what that is, it's not Hamburg. Hamburg is out in the north. Bad Hamburg is next to Frankfurt. Now it's part of Frankfurt. And uh, therefore, he, and he spends his summers there. So here's a guy who has to spend, who danced on eggs, because this is Germany in the early 20th century, and you want to try to get along with both sets of Orthodox Jews, and that wasn't, inter that wasn't easy once upon a time. You see? Because by the time I'm talking about, there's the Breuer wing, that's one group, and then there's the Hildesheimer, Hoffman, and all that wing of the other group. And oh my goodness, you know, it's a, it's a Cold War. You understand? There are people here who can tell you, right? This is it, 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 a cold war, and so uh, this is this is where he uh, lives. I say for the rest of his life, he's a Lidvak living in uh, in Germany, and now he can sit and write, and he does. And it's during these years he publishes his multi-volume, little by little, uh, thing on the called Dorothy showing him Geschichte, history of Jewish history of Jewish literature, and and, and so on and so forth. Uh, he doesn't give up politics. He's not just a little rabbi, you know, in Hertzberg or something like that, a little, little, uh, little shtibel. He's it's a guy who, by his own personal life and his Rolodex, as we would say today, knows everybody, okay? Uh, he's almost like a certain Forrest Gump. I mean, he's been everywhere, and he knows that he's friends with the Gare Rebbe, he's friends with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he's friends with this one, he's friends with that one. And no, you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. Um, from his small shtibel, he corresponds with all the gadolim around the world. 
So you wouldn't think you go to Hamburg, you see the big synagogue and all the rest of it, but those rabbis are people that you never heard of. Has anybody heard of Mordechai Amram Hirsch? Have you ever heard this name? Yeah. And, and yet, the, the, the guy who's got a small shul, a cloise and son of someone, uh, because of who he is, the, the letters are coming every day from Chaim Brisker, Chaim Meiser, from this rabbi, from that, all, all, all over the world. Now, um, at that time, the big challenge in the first part of the uh, first decade of the, the 20th century, cultural Zionism. Uh, there been Herzl, there been Chan Herzl died in 1904, trying to get Israel from the uh, world, and he didn't succeed. But then the Zionist movement was predominantly taken over by cultural Zionism of a Chan Ha'am, which wants to, uh, which they avow, I mean, they're not hiding this, they say they want to transform Judaism from a religion to a nationality, and we want to conquer the Kehilot, as they put it, and we want to have free elections all over Europe, and, and have our guys take over the communities and defund the Orthodox schools and exchange them for, what, I don't know, something to the left of Betafilla. No, I'm not meaning. In other words, uh, because Betafilla is a religious school, uh, 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 cultural Zionist schools. Uh, I can't even think of an analogy in America. But you understand, in other words, where you'll see that Judaism is a nationality, not a religion, that the Bible is a myth. It's our national myth, but it's a, it's a myth, and everything that goes along with that, okay? So uh, the Orthodox went crazy over this, and uh, the, the religious Zionists had a real problem because the Mizrahi, uh, they said like this, this should not be the official policy of the Zionist movement. Uh, every group should, have, should, 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 should do its own thing. The Mizrahi was outvoted. So I want you to understand, in the Zionist conferences of uh, 97, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, the Mizrahi would say that we want the Zionist movement to be on record that we, uh, we, we take no official position in regard to religion. And they were outvoted. <laughs> you see? They said, no, we do take a position in regard to religion, which is why people like Halevi and the others said, then why don't you leave the Mizrahi? Why, then why don't you secede from the Zionist movement since you've been rejected? And out of all this commotion comes the Agoda. All right? And uh, basically, uh, Yitzhak Isaac Halevi Rabinowitz, this uh, guy, the Stiebel in Hamburg, is the founder of the Agoda Sisro. He's the one who made it. And he did it because only he could do it because he was personal friends with... Uh, all the big machers. And so he could say to Chaim Britsky, I said, come and join this thing, uh, and don't give me any baloney, you and I go back and so forth. And he could write to the Ger Rebbe, we have the letters. And he said, oh, Benon Shal Kedoshim, that you're the, uh, the big deal over there, you're the uh, person who is, who is um, uh, you know, running so many Hasidim, and you should join this, and he'll say to the Germans, he had a real problem with the German Jewish politics, because he wants to invite Horowitz, but then Breuer won't come, you invite Breuer to this won't come, but he's trying his best to put together an independent orthodox organization for the world. And uh, it should be, as you can see, all the, he knew all these people and more. And because he was an indefatigable correspondent and he had time on his hands, so he got them all together in 1912 at Katowice. Perhaps you've heard of this. They found that their goodness is role should be a competition for the Zionist movement. You guys aren't the world movement of Jewry. We are. Right? You guys don't represent the Gedoli Torah. They represent the Jew. This is the argument. It didn't really get off the ground, but this is the idea uh, behind it. Only he could have pulled it off. He energizes German Jewish Orthodoxy, uh, at least a portion of it. Basically, he says German Jewish Orthodoxy is a frozen. You understand? It's just they're, they're stuck with Hirsch, and uh, the whole idea is just to be not reform, and there's nothing positive in it, and we have to go and, and re engage the Jewish youth with Jewish sources. And uh, you know, come with new and fresh approaches over here. Um, he, he's close with uh, the Rosenheim was younger at that time, and uh, what he called and Rai Breuer and others. And he's saying you need to, um, you know, uh, discover our past. We have to engage much more closely with Jewish knowledge. Um, we need youth groups. Uh, he had a whole kind of a he was he was one of these uh, as I say Koch levels. In this situation, that's when his books are published. So he obviously didn't mind being in the middle of controversy, and it stirred his creative juices. Now, he would, the books that are published are a very typical product of the yeshiva world. They're full of brilliant insights. They're horrible writing and worse editing. Okay? Uh, he needed a big time. He needed an editor big time. This is a, this is a comment. Everybody knows this. He needed, it just opened in one, one page. You'll see. He says he needed an editor big time. He never got an editor. You understand? And, and, and everything is fakrumt. So in those, he publishes everything backwards. In other words, the first volume is the last. You get it? There's the going and then it goes backwards. And not only that, in each volume, he works backwards. 
okay? I, I'll tell you again, he was a weird guy. Uh, he was brilliant, no, but, he, but, 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 but he didn't have a secular education, and he didn't have this gift of writing, as, as we understand it in the Western sense, okay? Uh, the book is totally, which is, I say, several volumes, many were published after his death from his notes. Uh, this is a, a book that's written for people holding and learning. In other words, already familiar with the writings of Gratz and Weiss and Rapport and Frankel and Geiger. He assumes you already read all this kind of stuff. There are long passages in the books uh, consisting of quoting and then strongly criticizing the works of these historians. That's basically a good part of the Dozer Shunem. Hachacham Gratz said this and this and this. Hey, and you know what you're talking about? Looking this way. You see, you're all wrong, you know? Like that. He's the first and the greatest of the Haredi Maskilim. Can I use that term? Right. Uh, he's definitely a Haredi in his whole outlook and his revolutionary and radical look towards what we call orthodoxy. And he is a total Moscow because he read all these books from these guys. He's writing in Hebrew. Uh, he's coming totally out of this milieu. Although he, I don't even know if he would reject that, that term. Uh, he attacks Gratz and Weiss and all the others et al. by name. He handles them roughly. He accuses them of superficial knowledge of the subject and deliberate inaccuracies and misrepresentations. The problem is, he then proceeds to prove his point. <laughs> you get it? He, you, he, notice he, he wrote very undiplomatically, uh, but he's, he's got one zinger after another. Oh, frankly, you said this and this. Have you ever seen this and this thing over here? It's that, it just shows the whole thing is totally wrong. A lot of times he's absolutely right. You understand? So it's a, it's a little bit embarrassing. His biting criticisms were damaging to many reputations. But after he finished, these guys didn't look so chashev anymore. You understand? Now, the students of these historians were still alive. And they, after all, they recently died, all these people, at the time he's writing this in the early 20th century. And his students, as they were furious, how can you criticize these great men? And he says, they're not great men. Is it? The students say, no, these historians have liberated us from legends and fairy tales using scientific and academic methods. They have told us how the past really was. And he says, no, they've not. They've abused the academic voice to put out shoddy and slipshod scholarship. Not only that, they have misused the academic voice to push what is really a reformed theological agenda, but they won't say so, which makes them dishonest and despicable. I say who and what my agenda is. They do not. They are taking advantage of the ignorance of the public, like Abraham Lincoln said. <laughs> the students, yeah. He says, Lincoln said you can fool all the people sometimes, some people all the time, you just can't fool everybody all the time. And I'm not even sure about that. Now, um, the students of these guys say, why are you always so ad hominem? You call people by their name, it's insulting. And he said, why is it okay for Gretz and Weiss to insult Hillel or Shammai or Arashi, but it's not all right for me to insult Gretz and Weiss? You think? In addition, so boy, oh boy, I mean, you know, when you read his book, somebody once said, it's like, you know, he walks into the bar, he takes a bottle, breaks it, and says, let's go. You understand? That's, that's it. It's, 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 it's taking polemics to an extreme. Now, um, in addition to his criticisms of the historians, he came up with dozens of original insights of his own. Some brilliant, some far-fetched. That's the way it's going to be with somebody who's, you know, he's a lot of original forts over there in the period of history he covers, which is the period of the Second Temple and the Talmud. That's it, you know, up to the Gonim. The period of the, what do you say, the Torah Shabbat Pep. Um, I'll give you two or three examples of what I'm talking about, because obviously I can't go into great detail about this. Uh, one is his very original take on the Sadducees and the Tzedukim, okay? Um, Nobody knows who the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Essenes really are. We have a passage in Josephus. We have a couple of places in the Talmud, very little. We have a couple of passages in the New Testament, and that's it. From that little business, everyone's trying to make a chant of their own and try to come up with it. Gretz had his version. This one had his version. Uh, the Christians definitely have their versions of this. Uh, he, I remember, it says that uh, if you read Josephus very closely, and he does, he does, so you'll find that uh, in the middle of the Second Temple period, when the Israel is ruled by the Ptolemies, a certain class of muksim, as they call them, tax gatherers, uh, latched on to the Ptolemaic Jews, Ptolemaic uh, government, and then they used their power to set up an independent mafia base, and then they're the ones who eventually morphed into the Hellenists, and they caused the Maccabean revolt, and they were the ones who were fighting the bloody battles with the Maccabees, and then when the Maccabees triumph and establish a, a Jewish state, 
Uh, so what happens to these guys? They reinvent themselves as the Sadducees because they won't go along with the Orthodox and they represent a power base and they battle it out with the Pharisees all throughout the period of the Hasmonean state. All this is told in great detail. Um, and uh, th therefore, they, they, that's why they always present a kind of a secular nationalism because they're against the Sanhedrin, which is run by, for a while they control the Sanhedrin, and then the Pharisees through politics regain control of Sanhedrin, and it's a whole thing back and forth, and that's where all the kings are. And then, of course, the Romans come in, and, uh, and they're part of the ones inviting the Romans in, and then they dominate the politics to the great detriment of the Jewish people because the voice of the masses and the Pharisees cannot be communicated to the Romans. So it was one grand miscommunication. It's a tragedy of Roman-Jewish uh, relations that could have been good. After all, what do we, what do from Jews care of the Roman Empire? So we'd be ruled the Roman Empire, pay taxes, but we'll just leave us alone, you know? And it didn't turn out that way. And then uh, through various means, the Herod uh, comes over. Then you have one mafia versus another. You know, only in the movies do all the bad guys get together in real life. A kills B. And so Herod wiped out the Sadducees to a, as, as much as he could. And by the time he died, you have two mafias running around in Israel, the Herodian-type mafias, which is one set of, of nobles and powerful people, the Sadducee ones left over. This plays it out. He, he plays it out in great detail down to the Chorban Beis Hamikdash. You know, when you have the different groups that were battling in Jerusalem in the civil war, the bloody civil wars that Josephus talks about, which one was the Sadducee one, which one was the other ones, and they messed, uh, they messed us over tremendously. And then when the temple is destroyed, they disappear from history. And the reason is, he says, they never had any religious principles at all. It's total opportunism. This is a major theory of his. It's total opportunism. They just reinvented themselves for political reasons all the time. They didn't believe anything except for power and money. And consequently, when the Jewish state ceased to exist, when the temple was literally flattened, when Jerusalem was literally, literally flattened, when Judea became nothing but a province, and there was no more fun in being Jewish anymore, they disappeared and went to Rome and other places, and we never saw them again. Right? Which actually means that the Corbin, he writes this. He said, Corbin was a terrible thing, but also a good thing. We got rid of all the junk because they were only there for a good time, Charlie. It's a very interesting kind. Now, there are parts of it you can critique, parts you accept, but I'm just trying to show you, he's not some yutz over here. He's got a whole worked out um, abyss over here. He has a whole take on the book of Maccabees and the fact that the oil, miracle of the oil is not there. He says, you read the book of Maccabees, which in the Apocrypha, especially the first book of Maccabees, everybody's saying, how come they talk about all the miracles? They leave out the, the oil being eight days. And he says, if you read closely, it takes up to the time of John Hyrcanus. We know John Hyrcanus was the one who converted to the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't like their Drabonans because, you know, because they're fighting against the Pharisees who are, who are identical, as he said, with the Drabonans. I hope I'm not confusing you too much. And, uh, and therefore, they, they wanted Hanukkah to be a national holiday because it was a victory to, of the Hasmonean dynasty, which is John Hyrcanus' thing, but they didn't want to play the part, of, which would explain why they have the rabbinic ordinance of making a menorah and lighting the candles. So again, he, you know, he thought it through. He worked it out. You can agree with it. You can disagree with it. But he's got something to say on this subject. He uh, sometimes takes on all the classic historians. He read all the Greek and Latin stuff. And there's a whole big thing that I mentioned uh, last summer, I think it was, or two summers ago, I don't remember anymore, about this huge rebellion that broke out in the time of Trajan, all throughout the Roman Empire, perhaps you recall. And uh, oh my goodness, the Roman and Greek writers have a whole business where they say, it's like a movie, you know, like Spartacus. They captured the Romans and made them fight each other to the death. You know, and the Jews ate their entrails and made belts out of the dead bodies that are going on. He said, they're all lying. 